Today, what we're doing is we're going to look at just the, the power of community and how important community is for our lives as a believer. So it's fitting that we're talking about launching our small groups and today looking at the need to be in deeper community and how the way God uses community to grow us in faith. One of my favorite book series growing up, and probably to this day still is one of my favorite book series, is, is Lord of the Rings. And it feels like the Lord of the Rings is quoted by pastors so much, but um, the Lord of the Rings was one of the very first real books I read as a middle schooler, kind of heavier, um, longer pipeline. And so I, back in the days before iPads and before uh, TVs and cars and screens that popped down in your minivan, we, we visited our family 15 hours away. And so that's a car ride with, with nothing but mom to hand out snacks occasionally and, and your imagination. And so I started to read The Lord of the Rings in these car rides back and forth to grandparents' houses. And so I read, I read all, all uh, four of the books that came with that series. And uh, I mean, I loved it so much. The movies are all good, but I love the books. In fact, just a little, little random story about how you can grow in marriage. When Pam and I went on our honeymoon, I don't know how this came up in the first couple of days of our marriage. I think like the first couple hours of our marriage, I found out she had never seen the Lord of the Rings movies. So me being the romantic, amazing genius that I am, we drove to Walmart the next day and bought a DVD player. And the, I'm pretty sure the, she says they're the extended editions. I think they're just the normal editions. And so for our honeymoon, I made her watch the, all the Lord of the Rings movies. And here, 19 years later, we're still married, and I'm much wiser. And she is much more clear about what she likes. But I, I, love, the, I love the Lord of the Rings. And, um, and one, of the, one of the founding principles of this book is, is the power of these friendships and the fellowship that these main characters form. You have, you have even a book called The Fellowship of the Ring, which, which are all these characters from diverse backgrounds and skill sets, from, from dwarves to elves to men to a wizard to little hairy hobbits. And all these different people bring aspects to a community. And, and sure, they have their struggles and their conflict and their difficulty, but, but the principle of the book is that they're stronger together than they are as individuals. And this is even highlighted even more as you get to the end of the series, and not, not to spoiler books that are, you know, many decades old, but when Frodo and his friend Sam get in the last books, together the friendship carries each other's burdens to accomplish the seemingly impossible mission. And that just reminds us that in community, community helps us achieve what is unachievable by ourselves. Community helps us grow. Community helps us, helps us in our faith. And that's, that's, what, that's a picture not just in general, like through a, non, or through a fiction book, but that principle is true of our faith, that God has wired the church community in such a way that we don't grow alone, but we're stronger together. And one of the dangers of faith is that we can make faith so personalized and individualized that we forget that it's actually the community where we grow best. And what I mean by that is much of our faith journey is oriented toward you. It's, there's a personal element to our faith. Like we believe you make a faith decision to follow Jesus. Nobody else makes it for you. It's you. You make a personal decision to follow Jesus Christ, to ask him to forgive your sins, to follow him. Like you have a personal quiet time. Like when you, when you go before God in prayer, we, we encourage that is to open your Bibles throughout the week and have a time with God where it's, you know, alone with you and God. Uh, God, God sends a spirit who dwells in you. Jesus died for you. And so there is a lot of individual aspects to our faith. But as you are saved and as you are, as you are receive faith through Jesus Christ, you are brought into a community. And in community, there's a diversity of gifts, of people. It's community that teaches us and trains us. It's community, honestly, that reveals the flesh and the sin that God is still working on. Like it's, it's in relationships where, where our sin is accountable and confronted and we're forced to make relationships refine us and grow. Uh, it's in community where we practice love and sacrifice and service. 
And it's in community where the gospel is displayed to a watching world. And so community is powerful. And so throughout this sermon series, this kind of short little three-week sermon series, we're looking at just a couple of key habits to make your 2024 year just a year of spiritual growth. We talked about prayer. We talked about Bible reading and study. And this week we're talking about leaning into community and how the community is a powerful part of your growth. And so to do that, I want to look at Romans chapter 1. And uh, I want to look at four, four pictures. And I, I think I can do this in our time, but, but you never know. Four pictures of a faith community at its best. Like what can community do and how can we create that here amongst ourselves and even as we deepen with friendships with one another. So 2024, a great vision is to lean into communities. So let me pray. And actually, let me read this passage. In this passage, it's um, Paul. He wrote the book of Romans. And he's always wanted to visit Rome, the Roman church. And he's, he's longed to be with them. And he expresses his desire to be with them. But you can see the power of community here. And I want to learn from this. So verse 8, I'm going to read to verse, verse 15. Paul says this. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because of the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit and in telling the good news about his son that I constantly mention you. Always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often have planned to come to you, but was prevented until now, in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, just as I have had among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. This picture of Paul's longing and desire to be with the Roman church gives us a picture of why community matters for you and I. So let me pray again, and let's dive into this passage more specifically. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for community. God, I know that in a, in a world that is so busy, and there's pressures in every direction, and it's easy to check out when we come home and even have kind of a, the, the illusion of, of community through all the means of social media and texting and all these things that are helpful to connect, but often sometimes give us a false community, God. Let us really dive into relationships, into knowing one another, into being known and loving well. God, help us to be, stand out with the power of community we have here. Help us to lean into this this year so that we are grown and, and the world watching us can see a fellowship and a heart for one another that is only explained by the transformation of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Thank you for your love for us and thank you for Christ, which unites us into community. Uh, beyond anything that we would have in common, but we are united in him. So thank you, and help us to grow in this over 2024. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So what, what does a community look like? What is a healthy faith community? What, what can it do? What should it do? And how can we lean into that? That's, that's what's driving these four pictures here. And so I'm going to move pretty quickly through them, uh, some big ideas. But here's the first idea. Communities celebrate God's work in each other's lives. One of the pictures we see here of Paul is that a healthy faith community celebrates what God is doing. That we get together, we know what's happening, and we celebrate the work of God. Look at verse 8. Here's how Paul begins. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported all around the world. Paul often, as he writes his letters, he expresses a burden for his churches. In fact, other passages in the Bible, Paul talks about how he has this, this anxiety that's always in him that, that drives him to pray for. Paul planted church after church after church. He won person after person after person to Jesus. And there is always this anxiety, I would call it a, a healthy weightiness, 
that these churches were following Christ, that these new believers were, were seeking Jesus. And so he was always concerned about these churches to the point that he would pray for them. You always see Paul talking about how he's praying for his churches, praying for this person, because he wanted them to, to adopt the fullness of Christ, to live out the gospel, to be the kind of church and the people that God wants them to be. But here, Paul didn't plant this church. Paul, Paul desires to go to Rome. He's anxious to go to Rome, but he didn't start this church. He doesn't necessarily know these believers personally, but he's still burdened for them. He, still, he sees the larger church, and he still prays for them. And, and the first thing he does is he thanks God for their testimony, that there are people all over the world, the known Roman Empire at the time, they're all the network of believers that is small but in existence, they're celebrating the fact that there in the capital of the Roman Empire, the gospel is taking roots. It's like, you know, if you think about D.C. and you go, what good could come out of D.C. right now with all the political stuff and, you know, all the junk and I don't care how you vote, but most of us go to D.C. and go, that cesspool of corrupt whatever. You know what I mean? None of us have a good, um, I shouldn't say none of us, but it's easy to have a negative view of Washington, you know, and all the stuff. We're not going to be political. But like, imagine that there was no church in America and all of a sudden you hear of this church forming in Washington, D.C. and you're like, man, that's awesome that there in the heart of the craziness there is, there is this church. And that's, what, that's what Rome, that, that's, that's even more so when Paul is saying this, this gospel that started in Jerusalem and has been spreading out through missionary activity has reached the very heart of the Roman Empire where Caesar is worshipped as God, where all these things are happening. The gospel is there. And so Paul's overjoyed with thankful, thankfulness that there at the heart of it all is the gospel. Now zooming out for a second, Paul did this a lot. Whenever Paul wrote his letters, he was thanking God for something that was going on in the church. In fact, 10 out of 13 of the letters that Paul wrote begin with some sort of celebration, some sort of thankfulness, some sort of aspect to, to bring out to light. And, and that shows us a very critical thing about the community of the church. Paul knew what was going on. These believers were sharing. Like, they had open lives to one another. So when Paul wrote a letter, when Paul heard from other traveling missionaries that, that God was doing this in this church, God was doing this in Ephesus, God was doing this in Philippi, God was doing this in Rome, like, the, the news traveled of what God was doing, and they celebrated it together. They, they thanked God for it. They were excited for it, that they celebrated the work of God. And this, this is a great thing for us to adopt, not just in our church, but in the big church, across the whole. I think, I think it happens relationally, one-on-one -on -one in our church, but it can happen even in other churches. We want to celebrate what God is doing in other churches. We want to celebrate what God is doing in Harford County. We want to celebrate what God is doing in other countries, and other continents. We want to be people who have a global focus to celebrate what God is doing. And, and this happens in so many different ways. I think about Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Romans chapter 12, verse 15 is a command that gives us, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That we want to celebrate with, when, when, things are, when things are excited and things are well and someone receives a blessing, we want to rejoice with somebody. When someone has a victory, when someone gets a promotion at work, when someone is even suffering, we want to come alongside them. We want to celebrate and we want to weep. We want, to, we want our lives to be intertangled in such a way that we, we celebrate and we do life together. We want people to see life together. And one of the dangers here is that we don't typically open up our lives in such a way that allows us to celebrate what God is doing, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like most of us like to live private lives. We come to church, we sit in the chair, we sing the songs, we lift our hands, we fill out the connecting card, we ask for maybe like maybe some prayers, but normally like maybe they're safe prayers, right? Um, pray for this, pray for that. They're safe. We, talk, we share safe things. But the community of God is called to be really open, like radically open about the way God is working, the way that God is, God is carving out hardships and, and difficulties, like radical transparency because our identity is in Christ, not our image. And so one of the, way, one of the reasons why we can't 
have this kind of community sometimes is because we keep ourselves just private. We keep our hands closed. It's not normal anymore, right? We like to keep that safe barrier. Perhaps another concern is that just you know, who would care about my life? And that just should not be the case. We want to be concerned. We want to care. We want to experience. Sometimes maybe jealousy keeps us from sharing. You ever had that like fear, whether, whether it's somebody else? You ever know that person that no matter what you share, like if there's something encouraging in your life and you share it with somebody, it's like, it's like God gave them the spiritual gift of discouragement. And so they want to poke at everything joyful in your life. Like, you, I just bought a house. Yay. Get ready for those bills. I bet your hot water heater is going to go up in your first six months. When we bought a house, my roof blew off. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. Like, as soon as you got good news, they're like, poke, poke, poke. You got a new job? Oh, man. Heard that commute's, you know, a bear. Good luck not seeing your family for the next, for any more. Or um, with other things. You know, I, you know, I'm committing to do a triathlon this year. I hope you like being on the bike for hours and hours and hours. Like, no matter what you do, it's like there are certain people in your life who like to poke at it instead of just saying, that's awesome. I'm glad that God is blessing. I'm glad that God is working that way. Let's celebrate that. And so rather than focusing on jealousy, whether it's fear of jealousy or just jealousy of others, man, Christ fees, frees us to celebrate with one another in a powerful way. And so let's, let's open up our lives. Let's be an open book. Let's be on the lookout for ways to celebrate, and let's lean in to celebration. Now, here's, here's the second thing we see in a community. We see that a community actually has a longing and a desire to, to build lives around each other. A healthy biblical community will not keep each other at an arm's distance, but would rather there's this, this longing to, to intertwine our lives and build lives together. And you see that here in verse 9 and 10. You see, you see the heart of Paul here, for community. He says this, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son that I constantly mention you, always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul simply says, you know, God, is, God knows my heart. God knows my prayer. God knows my testimony. And I love that little side note when he says, God, whom I serve with my spirit. In other words, God, who I serve with my whole heart. I'm a servant with my whole heart preaching the gospel that when I pray, I ask God to bring us together. I ask God that I'll be able to finally get to Rome, finally get to see you face to face, finally get to be in fellowship with you. In fact, I think we actually see two different ways that a community is built in this passage and little example of Paul. Firstly, he's, he's praying for them. You know, I, I almost didn't even have this as one of my thoughts originally when I looked at this passage, but then I was like, one of the, one of the ways that Paul is building a heart for the community is says that he is constantly mentioning them in his prayers. And, and how powerful of that is that for you and I? That one of the most simple ways and profound ways and accessible ways, you don't have to drive anywhere, you don't need any technology, you don't need anything but to pray that you and I can actually build our heart for community and our value for community just by simply praying for one another. Praying for one another will build a deeper care and deeper community for one another, just as Paul is saying here. And, and just think about that in marriage. Think about it in every, like there are so many ways that this is true. You, your spouses are, are, the more we pray for our spouses, the more we strengthen our marriage. The more we pray for our children, the more we parent our children better. The more we pray for our church family or even pray for our enemies, like our heart changes for them. One of the things I did at, at several churches ago when I was a worship pastor one of the things that me and the other pastors did every pastor meeting was actually take a, you know, you know the old school church directories where like Life Touch would come in and do like a, you know, a fancy photo and it would be all printed up. And it's honestly, I've done them before and they're a nightmare. But the, they're, they're so cool because we would take that, that church directory with all the silly photos and we would just pray for several, whatever, whatever pages it was so that once a month we are praying for everybody in the church, just working our way through that church directory. And man, it, what, it, just, it just changed our hearts for people. And that can be true for not just pastors, but for everybody. Praying for people changes our hearts for people. 
And Paul is modeling that here. So that's just a simple way to build community. But even look at this. Look at his longing here in verse 10. He says, I want to now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul's desire is to, to not be at a distance, but to be in their, in their presence, to be in proximity to them. And so Paul's desire and longing is to not just write a letter, but to be present in person. And that's such a good reminder that, that there is nothing that can be replaced the power of proximity to people's lives. I think about, um, I had in my sermon notes that three years ago when COVID made us short, shut down, but I think it's four years, isn't it? Four years ago when COVID made us shut down, um, it was a weird season and God blessed, like we had a good season. Um, we'd go, we went online, started streaming through Facebook Live, and uh, we would, we, we'd have funny ways to interact, and we did Zoom groups, and we did, we did some cool stuff when COVID took away proximity. But there was something powerful, that first church service when we came back together, even outside in the parking lot in like 90 degree weather, and spread out in lawn chairs, there was something powerful about seeing faces and talking that's one reason why we, you know, partially because there's also no internet in this room. But one of the reasons why we, we stopped our live stream was just because simply we believe in the power of proximity. Like Paul wasn't like, I'll catch you on the live stream, Romans. Great to know you. Like, you know, hit, hit me up on the chat while you're, while you're inter- interacting. Not that those things are bad. But Paul desired for more. And that, that's something for us that there is a sense that we long to be in proximity and build our lives together. I'll give, you, I'll give you a big passage. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. This is, this is the early church. So the, the church is like brand spanking new, weeks old. The, the, Jesus had just ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit had just indwelled believers. And so Acts chapter 2, baby church, listen for all the together kind of language here says this, with many, with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. And so those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them to the church. Now notice this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe, and many signs and wonders were being performed through the apostles. And now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed all the proceeds to those who had need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple, and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. Now, I don't have time to preach a second sermon on that. But from the day one of the church, togetherness was in their DNA. That they devoted themselves to learning together. They devoted themselves to breaking bread together. They devoted themselves to fellowship together. And it says every day, whether it be the temple and large groups of worship or in homes, they were meeting together and serving and growing and intertwining their lives together. And the way we do that today, it takes, it takes so much intentionality today. I think about just some of the ways that we can build a community like that, you know, through prayer and intentionality. I think, I think at the end of the day, what drives this community is, is love. That genuine love from Christ and his transformation will cause us to be this kind of community. And love is built through prayer. Love is built through pro, uh, proximity. But Jesus even said this in John chapter 13. His prayer for the disciples, his commandment for us actually is this. He says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you you are also to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Some strong words for us as a church. Love drives our fellowship. And it's what others, even the the outside watching world, sees a contagious love that is built on him. And when we have this love, love shows up in person, love shows up in proximity, Love wants to build our lives together. When you love someone, you want to build a life with them. In our busy world, it takes even, it takes even love would lead toward 
time and perspective, intentionality, and even commitment. At the end of the day, it's saying, I need this and I'll make this happen. And so here's my encouragement. As we see Paul longing to be in proximity, let's, let's adopt that perspective and heart for our church. Like, let's, let's make it a desire to be together, to want to see each other, to, to do things like groups and small groups, because we know that being together will drive this, and let's, let's make this kind of contagious community. And so I, w- I would, again, I would encourage you not to, not to harp on our groups, but a, a small group is a great place to, to do community, because even Sunday morning, you come, you sit down, we break down, go home. It's a lot, and it's busy, and it's fun. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's important, but one of the best ways to know a person is to, to sit around Panera Bread with a cup of coffee and just talk, to ask about questions, to, to come to somebody's house and, and have a meal, to build community beyond Sunday. Groups are a great way to do that. Uh, there are other ways to do that, but let me encourage you to lean into that building life. Now, let me, let me show you a couple other quick points because I don't have a ton here as we go through, but let me show you two other pictures. Not only do communities celebrate what God is doing, not only do communities build together their lives, but also communities actually mutually build each other's faith. Um, they build something together with Jesus in community. Notice verse 11 and 12. Paul says this, one of the, one of the reasons for his longing is this, for I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both, both yours and mine. See, see, Paul's longing to get together was not sightseeing in Rome. He wasn't like, man, I've never seen the Colosseum. It'd be sweet. Like, Paul's longing is not tourism. Paul's longing is not just to, just to catch up. Paul's longing is not just a social visit and like a, a nice cup of coffee, but Paul is actually looking for spiritual work to be done when they get together. Paul's longing and goal is to have this exchange of investment. And I love that because Paul begins by saying, I want to see you so that I may impart a spiritual gift on you. Not like a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit, but just a spiritual blessing, a spiritual encouragement, a strengthening word. He, he wants to teach them and mentor them and help them. He says, I want to impart on you a spiritual gift and for you to be encouraged. And that makes sense. Paul's Paul. Paul has been the driving missionary force of the early church. He's planted countless churches. He's the man. He's the guy. He's, he's uh, the use. He's the Tom Brady, and if you, I know, it hurts me to say that. He's the Tom Brady of missionaries in the early church. He's the goat of missionaries. So, so of course, Paul would show up at this church. If Paul walked in the door now, I'd be like, here's the Bible. I'll sit down and let's go. Like, that's just how it goes. So that makes sense that Paul is saying, I want to show up to help you. But what is mind-blowing is verse 12, where he says, also, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith both yours and mine. See, Paul's picture is not just one way here. I want to show up to help you poor Roman church. Paul says, I want to show up so that together we can learn. Together we can build our lives. The great Paul wants to be mutually built up and encouraged by this church. You know what that teaches us? No one outgrows their need for community. Not one person outgrows, outmatures. No one is like, I'm too knowledgeable for the church now. I got a PhD in biblical theology. I don't need the church anymore. Or, or I've been in church for 40 plus years. I've been to every Sunday school class. I don't, need, I don't need any church anymore. No one outgrows what they can learn and how they can learn and their need for community. And this is true for me. Like I, I remember teaching, teaching, I mean, I had a doctorate at that time and I was teaching VBS like four-year-olds. And those crazy kids asked questions that I was like, huh, I don't know. Like, those kids ask questions. They taught me. Youth groups, same thing. Like, doesn't matter who you are, how mature you are, we can learn together. And that's what I love about some of our small groups and our one-on-one time is when we open up a passage together and I see something in there and you see something in there, and they might be different, biblical, contextual, accurate, interpreted correctly, but but we, we see things and we apply things differently so that way we mutually encourage one another. And imagine if we adopted this vision for our church, 
where every time we stepped into proximity, our goal was an exchange of encouragement, of faith to be, to be built up. Like to, and this is convicting because how many conversations do I have that revolve around coffee or ketchup or sports or whatever it might be when like we really want to get deeper into what God is doing in our lives. And so asking ourselves, what can I do to strengthen this person? So one of the marks of a healthy, our pictures here, is that there's a mutual exchange. Now here, quickly, here's the last thing. Communities preach the gospel to one another. Communities, God's faith community preaches the gospel to each other. Verse 13 through 15. Now I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I've often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, just as I have had among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated to both Jews and Greeks, or both Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. And so I am eager eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. Paul says, now, look, I've been wanting to come, but at the end of the day, I keep on getting... We don't know why. We don't know what was going on. But for whatever reason, he's not been able to get to this church. And he says, I long to be there. I'm eager to be there. I'm under an obligation, a weightiness to preach the gospel. And so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you, to your church. And what I find so fascinating is this church already knew the gospel. This church already knew Jesus they had, already, they had already committed to Jesus Christ. They're believers. Paul said at the beginning of our verse, you're, the news of your faith is being celebrated all around the world. So why would Paul then say that he's eager to come preach the gospel to you also, to this church and to others in Rome? And one of the reasons is there's still a whole lot of more people in Rome to reach. But also, it's a reminder that every single one of us continually need the good news of Jesus Christ preached And reminded to us. You never outgrow the need for the gospel. Many of us kind of think about the news of Jesus Christ as like step one. Like the gospel is Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and on the third day he rose again, and I must believe in him, repent for my sins, and trust in him. That's step one of my faith, but now I move on to other things. That that's not that's not how we view faith. It's like A, you know, the you know, the gospel is A, but I'm on I'm on step three in my instruction, so I'm like a C and D Christian because I've moved on past step one. That's not the way we view the good news of Jesus. Instead, the good news of Jesus Christ is like a foundation or a house we move into. It's a truth we build our lives on. It's not a step in our faith. It's the whole of our faith. And so every stage of our lives, every moment, every, every spiritual battle, every spiritual victory, whatever it looks like, every stage of your faith, we need to remind each other of the good news of Jesus Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ, and how to live it out. And that happens in community. Because the good days and the bad days, we speak to each other in this. And we remind each other that God is real. Jesus loves us. Our identity is in him. There's grace in our hardships. God is sovereign. He cares for you. And he's working through Jesus in your life right now. There are times when you can, you can t- preach yourself that. But there are times that that needs to be preached to you. And we preach it to each other. So in community, we preach the gospel to each other. And we desperately need that reminder that Jesus is good, his gospel is real, and our hope is eternal. And so let's let's build that kind of community, way better than Fellowship of the Rings, way better than Lord of the Rings, a community built on Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. That's our strength. That's our hope. And so my goal for 2024, personally and with our church, is just to build this community together where we do, we celebrate what God is doing, where we long to be together. Like, we don't want to miss things. We don't want to, we don't want to be away. We want to be in proximity, where we mutually grow together and we ultimately become a gospel expression, preaching to one another. Let's, let's build that sort of community. Step one, of course, is, I shouldn't say step one because I just made fun of that, but, but, the, but the entrance into that community, the beginning of your journey of faith is through your own personal decision to follow Jesus Christ when you're brought into that community. So if you've never made the decision to follow Christ, I'd encourage you to do so. The gospel is there waiting to build a community, and it's hard sometimes. It's, you know, people are weird. It's hard sometimes. 
you're weird. It's hard sometimes. Like, we all have barriers, but God has given us a beautiful community. Let's build it together. My reflection question is this. What will you do to build this sort of community? And so as I close in prayer, and I know, I know I'm already running late, as I knew I would be, let's close in prayer and just let that question soak in as you leave here today. What does it look like for you to build community? Maybe you need to, maybe you need to explore Jesus as your Savior more. Take those beginning steps of faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you just need to commit more to this or that or join a group or whatever it looks like. Come early to come 15 minutes early to church, which would be on time for many of us. Um, come 15 minutes early to church and jump in and shake some hands and smile. Stick around for a little longer. Whatever it looks like, what are some small steps to build a community that, and I, by the way, I say that totally in love. I feel bad now. Um, you know, like, good job. Real way to build a community. Um, let's build community together and let's make this us. So let's pray.